Good evening. It's a pleasure to see you all. I'm Paola Antonelli. I'm a director of R&D here at MoMA. Also, I'm a senior curator of architecture and design. And I haven't seen you, I mean, some of you I haven't seen in almost a year because that's the last time that we had a salon here. It was a salon about fluidity. Then there was, I took a hiatus. I was on sabbatical. I did a salon at Harvard about hybridity, and then I've been really missing you, and now I'm back, <laughs> and uh, I'm so happy that the salon happens tonight, because we've so had enough with anything that concerns the elections tomorrow. So <laughs> this salon is for us all. <laughs> this salon is for us all to think of what happens beyond yeah. tomorrow, beyond all the white noise and all the uh, yellow and uh, green noise that we heard in these past few months, or it seems that it's been years. So the Salon tonight is about the future, but not any future. It's about an informed future. It's about a future that is based on not only what we know, but also what we want. It's an optimistic Salon, and it's a Salon where we'll discuss what we can not only expect, but also build into the future. And as you know, um, the R&D department at MoMA was born with this idea to help the future that we are building. You know, museums are these temples that uh, very often discuss the past, maybe the present, but they're not really considered by many workshops and labs for the future. And instead, more and more, so many of my colleagues and so many of my colleague institutions are trying to actually take an active role and see what they can contribute to help people and citizens build their own future. So tonight's salon is in that spirit and the whole R&D department is in that spirit. What we do is we meet maybe once every other month and we pick a topic that is relevant to the outside world that is not just with the, within the ivory tower, within the art bubble, but is instead really important for society. And we try to offer something that the museum can contribute. So talking about the future, what future can be foretold or built both by scientists, by experts, and also by artists and uh, by citizens is what we'll be doing tonight. And you know, Alvin Toffler, who wrote Future Shock, probably he was the first futurist or the one that really crystallized and made this kind of practice famous, wrote that change is the process by which the future invades our lives in, in his characteristic florid prose that made so many of his contemporary critics think that he was not such a good writer after all. But he, he, he uh, wrote all these bestsellers and he remains like the, the kind of uh, uh, the, the narrator of the future for us all in our mind. You know, in the informed future means having some basis to predict it, but for a very long time we've let the gods or nature or a few interpreters and middle people in between the gods and us predict this future, and we still do that. I mean, you can go back to ancient times and to Greece with the Temple of Pythia where the oracle would foretell the future, and to this day in Tibet, the oracle, the Nichan, tells the Dalai Lama what the future will be, and with many different degrees in between, so many heads of state still rely on this kind of pseudoscience, so much so that there are protests that are happening right now in South Korea, because the people of South Korea are outraged because their president apparently relies on one such they consider charlatan to help her in the decisions that she needs to make. But you know, there are so many different forecasting methods that uh, we try to base on science, but we never know if it's real science or if it's instead only pseudoscience. Pseudoscience is tarot reading, it's like, uh, cartomantics, it's like reading your hands, and you see there's this beautiful fortune teller by Caravaggio. They're all kind of grouped together, these kind of methods under the term pseudoscience. But palmistry, or astrology, tarot reading go back to, uh, go back in the centuries and are sometimes based on some uh, readings of nature that could, base, could be based on some information. Then there are very different perspectives on the future and on an informed future that come 
from all these different realms. In physics, you know, we've given you just some examples. Of course, it's not like the whole breadth of possibilities, but special relativity makes it so that the future belongs, is in the eye of the beholder in a way, because uh, the faster a person is moving away from a moving object, the slower the object seems to move. So it's about a sense of time that is not as absolute anymore. Uh, or in philosophy, Presentism is the opposite of eternalism, and they both are the opposite, as happens in philosophy, of growing block views. So it's about believing that only the present exists, or that only the past and the present exists, or that everything exists at the same time. So you see there are so many different ways to think also of the uh, self in the, towards future. Like in psychology, the end of history illusion <coughs> talks about the fact that we always think about the future as if we never changed as human beings, but in truth, we are moving targets as much as the future is a moving target. And we will never ever be able to really grasp the future because we are going to be part of that evolution. When it comes to religion, well, there are so many different ways and so many different flavors of future depending on the religion that you abide by that I don't even want to begin. I just come back from a trip to India and Bangladesh where I was doing research for the items exhibition for next year about garments. So maybe karma is the one that I feel closer to me today. But eschatology and the afterlife or none of the above is also part of the same discussion. And then we get to art and design and literature, maybe some of the most comfortable ways to read the future in this room. Um, and we can talk about when it comes to design, speculative design and uh, futurism. When it comes to literature, the science fiction and fantastic realism. And also, and tonight we'll talk about it more, the different specific ways to read the future that belong um, in specific communities like Afrofuturism or and Asia Futurism. Is Don here by any chance? Don Chan, yeah, you're here. So we have Itasha for Afrofuturism and we have Don for Asia Futurism, which is great. Um, but when it comes to truly informed ways, scientific ways to read the future, maybe the most well-known theories are chaos theory, in particular the work of Edward Lawrence, who was also the famous um, formulator of the butterfly effect. And it says so that future is based on the idea that chaos is when the present determines the future, but the approximate present does not approximately determine the future. And that was a happenstance formulation, a finding that he made when he picked up an experiment halfway and he noticed that the result was completely different just because of the different context. So Edward Lawrence formulated this effect, uh, the butterfly effect, which is what made him very famous. And we all have all come to know it as the fact that a very small action can have an immediate and resounding reaction in the future and can change the destinies of the world. Another theory that is quite well known is Karl Popper's falsifiability and verifiability theory. And what is really interesting about it is that um, it's about opening up to criticism and to, to confutation. So uh, Popper's idea is that it is easy to obtain confirmations or verifications for nearly every theory if we look for confirmation. So we can pretty much make any kind of hypothesis and we'll find a way to confirm that hypothesis. But confirmations should count only if they are the result of risky predictions. A theory which is not refutable by any conceivable event is non-scientific. Irrefutability is not a virtue of a theory, as people often think, but a vice. Every genuine test of a theory is an attempt to falsify it or refute it. In other words, go out on a limb and try to confirm your beliefs until somebody else will refute them. And in that case, the whole world will know they're true. It's kind of a convoluted but really interesting idea. Karl Popper became then um, known for 
other reasons. He was ba the basis for, uh, for instance, Thatcher's, Thatcherism. So in a way, his legacy is not as crystal clear. But in this particular openness to uh, trial, to test of theories, is what we read about the future according to him. Of course, another well-known theory is Nassim Taleb's black swan. And Nassim Taleb was not the first one to talk about black swans. We go back to Latin times. He was the poet Juvenal that first talked about black swans as being the exceptions that change completely any idea that we might have about a specific uh, field. And in that case, it was the fact that swans were all white. Well, the black swan event is an event that is completely uh, a surprise that, is, that has really gigantic impact and that we try to rationalize in hindsight. And what is really interesting is that there are so many of these events that they're almost a normalcy. And the Black Swan book is about uh, an attempt to strengthen society in order to uh, enable it to, withdraw, to withstand such events. So it's interesting because it's almost a preventative book. It's not about talking about the existence of these events. These have existed for all of our history. It's about getting ready for them. And interestingly, this book was particularly co-opted by the financial system. Today, I was looking at people at who really quoted and studied this book. And it turns out that it's the financial sector, almost as if they were trying to find a way to assuage their guilt, in particular for 2008 and the financial <laughs> crisis, very interestingly so. So in hindsight, we can fix everything. So um, right now, we're in the middle of this amazing white noise, deafening white noise for the elections. And we are trying desperately to go beyond it and to find some foundation, some information, some data. And I'm not talking about polls. I'm talking about basic human beliefs to understand what's going on and to try and figure out what will happen next. And you know, there are so many people that we can talk to. And there are many different people that can help us understand the future. And I wanted to have a few here in this slide. So there are the trend forecasters. And I'm putting here some friends and some people that I don't know yet, but I would like to know. So one is Sharon Lee. You see her on the um, upper left corner. She's a, a wonderful, not even trend forecaster, but she's really an instigator. She's been uh, looking at teens for the past 20 years. So she's been looking at generations of teens coming one after the other. In the middle, ne next is Lee Edelcourt. Some of you might know her. She is very active in the world of design and in fa and fashion. And uh, she has been working in fashion for many years, but also put out a wonderful magazine that was called Colors that, not Colors, what am I talking about? It was called Bloom. It was about flowers. Colors is another one. And, uh, and right now, she's also teaching at Tarsons. I think she's running a department. I'm always bad with titles, but Tim, you can, you can explain it afterwards if you want to. But she's really very good at understanding the world of design and the world of fashion. Next is a diagram from Kay Hall's report that introduced the term norm core. So Kay Hall, that now kind of disbanded, was a small guerrilla group in New York City that was observing and kind of inferring uh, new trends in society. And uh, the idea of norm core, I'm, I'm sure. How many of you know norm core? OK, good. I thought, I mean, by this audience, right? But so. Um, they're pretty good at understanding what comes just next. And then, last but not least, is Omoyemi Akerele, that's based in Lagos, that's doing the same thing, especially translating the new trends in Africa for the Western world. You could say the trend forecasters have launched their forecasts about one or two years in advance, not that much. It's about, um, in a way, alerting the industry and helping consulting for companies that will need to deal with consumers. They still call them consumers, like <laughs> we call them citizens, but they're dealing with a pretty short-term uh, future. Then we have the long-term future visionaries. So I'm showing you there up um, top right, Danny Hillis and Stuart Brand, who together founded the Long Now Foundation. They are two fantastic human beings. And uh, uh, you might know that Stuart Brand was also the founder of the Good Earth Catalog. And the Long Now Foundation is about <coughs> thousands of years from now. It's about thinking slow and long term. 
And then we have the visionaries like Steve Jobs that don't really forecast the future, but rather arrogantly make it and uh, don't really wait for somebody to tell them what's going to happen. I know it's a platitude, but it's the truth. You know, there are some people that just act that way. Uh, you have then the science fiction writers that pretend they're writing fiction, but in reality, they're already kind of telling you what's going to happen, and then what they say actually happens. And you see there Margaret Atwood, the great Octavia Butler, and late Octavia Butler, and William Gibson. And then last but not least, the futurists, like Fate Popcorn and Paul Sappho, that are the ones that maybe are closest, in some cases, to the pseudoscience of yesteryear, and that are in some other cases instead much closer to being um, trend forecasters but also buttressed by scientific studies and data. So it's, it's interesting to see how many different categories exist. But I was telling you about the sci-fi writers. Well, I don't have to tell you about Méliès and the Voyage dans la Lune, which was 1908, and the fact that the voyage to the moon actually happened. Or, of course, 2001 A Space Odyssey and all sorts of tablets and iPads and Back to the Future and Virtual Reality. And you can go on forever with examples. There's this beautiful outline of the predictions in fiction that became real that actually is the work of Georgia here. It's impossible to look at in this particular slide, but if you Google on brain pickings, and, uh, and you Google Brain Pickings Georgia Lupi, you can go and look at it and really dive through. It's a wonderful outline of uh, fictionary predictions that became true. And here is some more literature looking backwards. 1888, Edward Bellamy, it predicted credit cards. The world set free predicted the atomic bomb, H.G. Wells. And of course, Neuromancer, Neuromancer, Neuromancer. How many times have we quoted it? It predicted the World Wide Web. So it really is. Uh, it's kind of, we can be confident, we can trust artists to have a sense of the future that can really compare and, uh, uh, and can give a good time and a good rivalry also to futurists and trend forecasters. And you see here Walter Pickler and his TV helmet of 1967 and some artists of today with a field design group in 2015 and the Oculus in between. So artists are always helping us, and designers especially, are always helping us deal with change. You know, I like to say that designers exist to help people deal with change, that they take revolutions in science and technology and make them into objects that all of us can use, therefore allowing us to metabolize progress and to make it happen. Going in history, just a few designers that were all about the future, well, Bucky Fuller, of course, many architects. You know, you see here just a few architects. One of the great Japanese metabolists of the 1960s, Kiyonori Kikutake. Then the famous Archigram Walking City. Oh, wait, I have a laser beam. Yay. So <laughs> Archigram, the Walking City, and Super Studios, Life Without Objects in 1969. And of course, Le Corbusier and the um, the La Ville Radieuse in 1924, and you can see how so much of the world is built that way. And in a way, Le Corbusier was like Steve Jobs. He just like built the future the way he saw it. Um, Klaus Schwab from the World Economic Forum has um, published this report that was the fruit of a collaboration with hundreds of different experts that, um, that kind of hover around the World Economic Forum about the fourth industrial revolution, which is a revolution that sees uh, a new, um, a new platform that puts together the digital space, the physical space, and biology. So it's about changes that happen that cannot anymore be attributed to any particular part of our being or of our environment, so integral and organic they are. And that's what so many artists are helping us with with movies, with sci-fi, with speculative work, um, also with demonstrations of this kind. I really love the work of Hiroshi Ishiguro. He's a, a scientist in Osaka, and he studies the relationship between human beings and machines. So what you see here 
is uh, Matsuko Deluxe, who is uh, a Japanese television anchor, um, in a gay man, cross-dresser, matronly, favors this particular style of mumus with like big jewelry, and the humanoid that replicates Matsuko exactly, and they have a TV show together. So one of them is the humanoid, the other one is the person. I find this really beautiful because it really brings you to think about what it is that you, of you that you can put into a machine. I was telling you about speculation. You know, speculative design is extremely important. Of course, it's my area of interest, so I know it maybe better than other areas, but I have to say that the distinction that speculative designers, especially um, Tony Dunn and Fiona Rabi, Tony and Fiona, are you here? No, not yet, but they're supposed to come later. But they, um, they have kind of established this particular practice in the past 15 years. And this is a diagram that was um, designed by Stuart Candy, who's a, a future studies expert that's based in Canada. So you see, there's the present, and then there's all these different futures. There's the possible future, which is the one that's about to happen. There's the plausible future, which is the one where most designers work. So they take what is already uh, available and they build this future. But then there's a probable and preferable future, and that's where speculative designers work. They try to steer the future in that direction. They try to steer design in that direction. They're not as arrogant and totalitarian as Steve Jobs or Le Corbusier, but they have a little bit of gumption, and they try to push things in there in the right angle and in the right direction. And you see here, um, this is an homage also to Amy, because Amy puts out these this newsletters that are the future of, and uh, the most recent was the future of robot companion, of companion robots. And so I wanted to quote here, uh, Dan and Raby, this series of robots that is in the MoMA collection from 2007. It hypothesizes a future in which robots, companion robots, are not so servile and nice like Rosie and the Jetsons, but they are neurotic and they need to be taken care of and convinced before they start taking care of you. So one needs to be taken in the arms and cuddled, the other one trembles when there's a magnetic field. So it's all about having a different relationship with them. On the other hand, there is some design that is based on plausible future. There is some design that responds to needs that are present and real that can help us steer the future in a different direction. For instance, um, this particular data visualization by Spatial Information Design Lab at Columbia University, I use it all the time as a great example. This visualization gives you a sense of reality. So it's about the past and the present but it can be amazing and incisive in building a future. It tells you how, many, um, how much money the government spends for certain blocks in inner cities in the United States to keep some of the inhabitants uh, of that block either in prison or in halfway houses. So it tells you that there are more than 300 of these blocks in Brooklyn alone. And it tells you that by not simply giving you figures that can leave you outraged for 20 minutes, but then they leave you indifferent. It gives you this kind of blood red splotches onto a black map of Brooklyn. And these splotches will stay with you. They will engrave themselves in your mind with their elegance and their strength. And they will make it so that you will change the way you see the future, that you will think that there must be alternatives possible. And indeed, the actual limits of what is achievable depend in part on the beliefs people hold about what sorts of alternatives are viable. And this is a thought that I would like to leave with you for tomorrow, you know, to get you through tomorrow. And tonight, to talk about what our <laughs> perception of the possibilities are, we have four outstanding human beings that I love so much and that have four different takes on the future. We're going to start in order of appearance with Amy Webb from Web Media. And you already have all of your bios in your folder, so I'm not going to recite the bio. But Amy has been putting out these great newsletters that are the future of, that come out every, um, every month, more or less, that are so interesting because she gathers under a particular umbrella. Ah, here you are. I just quoted you. I'm glad yeah. you're here. Um, the, and the particular umbrella, she, she gathers the future of something in particular. So they're really quite interesting. After Amy, we'll have 
Itasha. Itasha Womack. Itasha is a filmmaker, an artist, an author, and she's an expert in Afrofuturism. So she is able to um, explain a possible future from a particular angle that is very incisive and very influential today. After Itasha, we'll have Georgia. Georgia Lupi is a visualization designer. So in a way, she is, uh, if we look at the philosophical and psychological ways to look at the future, she's a presentist in that uh, she looks at the past and the present, and she always deals with the past and the present because she looks usually at data that are about the past and the present. But by doing so, she also infers the future in a way that is clear and quite powerful. And last but not least, we have Ari Wallach. Ari is a, a, a great futurist that works a lot with the governments and with NGOs. And I have to say it because I was so impressed when I found out it was him. I, I admired the program before knowing it was him, but he was the author of The Great Schlepp. You might remember The Great Schlepp. From which election was it? 2008. 2008, remember? Yeah, about convincing your grandparents in Florida uh, to, vote, to vote Democrats. So. Um, <laughs> We'll have them here tonight. And by the way, we're live streaming tonight, just so you know. And we also added um, a hashtag to uh, our uh, offering. So if you don't mind um, using as a hashtag MoMA Salon, that would be great. So I would like to welcome here first, Amy Webb. <laughs> 